Well, Colin, previously we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing. Yes. Today we're talking about John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness, mm -hmm. which means next time we get together, we have to discuss the other film in his Apocalypse trilogy, Prince Ghost of Darkness. Of Mars. What? So I heard this movie was shot in Toronto. It was. Is that the only reason we're talking about it? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we have a theme. Anytime we come on, we have to just talk about films that are shot in Toronto. In and around Toronto, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in the Mouth of Madness, this was uh, 1994. This was when John Carpenter was coming out of you know, the 70s and 80s and his his mystical 70s and 80s powers were... Everyone talks about the 80s, the 80s run. Every movie was amazing. Every movie was great. And then uh, hit the 90s and hit a wall, which I don't necessarily agree with. It wasn't as sudden as everybody likes to say. No, it not at all. I think it was kind of like... Uh, no, he still had some like good movies, like the one we're going to talk about. Um, but then he had like, you know, Memoirs of Invisible Men. It's okay. It's watchable. Yeah, it's Sam odd. Neill was in it. Yeah, for sure. I wonder if that's like, you know, the first time they were together. That's, and, yeah, that's yeah. what introduced them. And... Oh, or John Carpenter saw Jurassic Park. And he's like, I want that guy. I and I said, guy. John, you worked with him before. He's he like, said, I did? What? <laughs> 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 and he's playing his video games. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think out of the 90s stuff, this is definitely his best movie. I would say so, um, yeah. I would say it's... It's it's just a hair under being one of his great movies. Yeah, I, I would say the same. Because I, I think the, the first half of it is like perfect John Carpenter stuff. Right. And then it kind of loses a bit in the second half, mm -hmm. in my opinion. No, I would I would totally agree. But um, I don't want to say it's a lesser Carpenter film, but it, I think it's it's very, very good. And yeah. I really, really like it. So I, I, I don't know why people say that. You know, he's sort of got some... I, I don't know if people have a love for Escape from L.A. I still get a, I still get a kick out of it, but it's uh, not a good movie. That and Ghosts of Mars, both of them, I can't even enjoy in like a campy way. Ghosts of Mars is the worst. That is, I would say, borderline unwatchable. Yeah, and there are some people that, ha that well, yeah, but it's campy. It's got no, it's Pam not. Greer and Ice Cube. And Camp it's like, is fun. Yeah, that no, is, it's that so is not dull. a fun movie. It's, yeah, so many dissolves. <laughs> flashbacks. Nothing but dissolves. When I think of that movie, I just think of dissolves. <laughs> the movie starts with a flashback, and then there is a flashback, and then within that flashback, there's another flashback. So yeah. there's... It's, yeah. it's layers. <laughs> um, so this one, yeah, this sort of came out. I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it much later. Yeah, I saw it on video after the fact. Uh, I didn't really think much of it. I didn't, hadn't really heard anything about it. Uh, do you want to talk about the general plot? Yeah. Um, it, it's the most, one of the best Lovecraft movies ever made, even though it's not based on Lovecraft yeah. at all. So you don't have to feel bad about it's enjoying love something written by horrible racists, yeah, which is helpful. It's, it's Lovecraftian. It's Lovecraftian, as the kids like to say. Yeah. The monsters are always, the horrors are always indescribable. Yes. So, yeah. You know, uh, sometimes they take, uh, take place in flashbacks. So like this movie kind of starts out. You know, Sam Neill's being dragged into the uh, insane asylum, and then the whole sort of story takes place in a flashback. Yeah, he's a he's a private detective. Mm -hmm. um, he's like a private insurance investigator. Yeah, the, the opening scene with him is interrogating uh, Jason. What's that actor's name? I don't know. I recognized him from. A lot uh, he, of stuff, he's in though. a bunch of John Carpenter movies. Yeah. Can't, Peter Jason is his name. Oh, okay. In his sweatiest role to date. Oh, that's right. He's uh, like, it's oh, it's a great kind of like film noirish because the movie isn't film noir, but that scene feels very film noir. Yeah, the AC is turned off. He's yeah, like, "You getting yeah. hot? Would you like a smoke?" You yeah, know, that sort of thing. Him and, and Bernie Casey for some reason. Oh, yeah, that's right. Movie? Yeah, it's a lot of people who are just like have kind of smaller roles. Like sure, da for, David Warner's in this movie. Yeah, yeah. For not a very big role. Mm -hmm. John Glover shows John up, Glover, who's, yeah. of course, uh, Clamp in Gremlins 2, The New Batch, the best film ever made. That's right. Oh, good. I finally get to use my secret exit. And he was um, that weird, like, Tim Burton-looking doctor in uh, Batman and Robin. Um, so the insane asylum, so this is, this is interesting. Like I, we said, this whole movie is like shot in and around Toronto. The insane asylum is like the R.C. Harris water filtration plant in Toronto. And it's required by law that any movie that is shot in Toronto, you have to shoot a scene there. As an insane asylum. As an insane asylum. Yeah. Uh, we saw it previously in Strange Brew as the insane asylum. It's getting to the point where he's like, you, you just really can't shoot there anymore. But it's a beautiful building. It's like Art Deco. It was built in like the 1930s, I think. Um, is it is are the interiors in this? The interiors That's are actually I, shot there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I had to look that up. I didn't think 
they would allow anybody inside, but uh, uh, I found it on Google, and yeah, it's like the interior. Hmm. So they must have just sort of dressed it to look like the individual uh, rooms. Okay, but yeah, we, the movie starts, uh, Sam Neill is being dragged into the insane asylum. <laughs> yeah, and he's just uh, like off his nuts. I'm not insane, you hear me? I'm not insane! I, I, I love Sam Neill. I've yeah. grown to love him as I've gotten older. When I was a kid, I just knew him as the guy from Jurassic Park. Right. The point is, you are alive when they start to eat you. That's exactly um, And then the when thing. I saw this movie, I guess it was a year after Jurassic Park, that's all? It was one year later. It was 94. Yeah. But obviously he's in it because, you know, he met John Carpenter on uh, Memoirs, Memoirs of an Invisible Man. But, uh, yeah, no, later in life, seeing him in, like, Possession is one of my favorite movies, and he's yes. amazing in that yeah, movie. Yeah, he's really good. He's really great in this movie because he's so, he's a skeptic. Mm -hmm. Through the whole movie, he constantly, well, I guess we should explain the plot. He gets right. uh, hired by this uh, publishing company to find... By Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston is the <laughs> head of this company. Now, everybody out now, please. I need time with Mr. Trent. Uh, have Sylvia hold the calls and you get Linda in here. Yes, Mr. Yeah, it was great. I almost left myself. <laughs> Sit down. But their their best selling author, Sutter Kane, mm -hmm. who is essentially it's kind of weird because he's essentially like a Stephen King slash HP Lovecraft kind of hybrid character. Right. Um, but his name is Sutter Kane, which sounds like Stephen King. Yeah. But then they mention Stephen King in the movie. You can forget about Stephen King. Kane outsells them all. You don't need to, met, like, the name sounds so similar that's clearly who you're evoking. It's bizarre that they both yeah. exist in this world. Well, it's funny. Um, I th like, Carpenter is probably, like, good friends with Stephen King, and it was kind of like a jokey thing. Mm. Okay. Sutter Kane has gone missing. Right. They hire uh, uh, Sam Neill to, to figure out where he went. They have, right. they, they need his unfinished latest manuscript mm -hmm. is, is the, the situation. So they want to they investigate it, see if it's some sort of scam, and yeah. they send Sam Neill off with, uh, I guess, an employee. Editor. She's an editor. She's the editor. She's, yeah. Yeah, she's his editor. We meet his agent later. Yeah. Um, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so they go off to Sam Neill. Kind of puts the pieces together of all the the covers of all of his books. Have these red lines around them. Yeah. Cuts them out. Realizes that it's an actual map, map of of uh, is it New Hampshire? They f they follow the map to the what is thought to be the fictional town of Hobbs End, mm -hmm. which is where all of Sutter King's. I want to keep saying Sutter Kang, <laughs> Sutter Krang <laughs> from <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Makes a great contest, doesn't it? Put the pieces together, find the town, win a Sutter Kang lunchbox. Sutter Kane's books take place there. It's not supposed to be a real place. Right. They go to investigate it and discover it is a real town. Mm -hmm. And everything that Sutter Kane has written about is, is, coming, is, is, real. is real and coming to be true. And his right. next book is about monsters taking over and the world ending. Right. Uh, so it's kind of about our kind of perception of reality completely switching. Right. That's the basic setup. And then it kind of goes into, uh, for John Carpenter, un, uh, unusually surreal territories. Lots it of does. Lots of surreal there's, imagery. And, yeah, there's lots of like uh, repeating imagery and yeah. uh, dreams that, you know, he'll like walk by that alley and see the cop kind of beating up the guy. And then that'll be sort of repeated, you know, later things will like mutate. You can almost like see the the book's influence sort of like infecting his vision. Yeah, and well that's that's the whole idea is that these books, they say for the kind of uh, simpler folk that read his books, right. uh, it kind of infects their brain and, and has a little bit of a power over them. And I think that the idea is that the more people read and believe in these books, it's giving these sort of ancient beings more power yeah. uh, so they can uh, expand their influence. Yeah, the, the more people believe, the more it kind of does become reality. Right. Whoa, whoa, we're not talking about reality. Yeah, we're talking about fiction. It's different, you know? A reality is just what we tell each other it is. Sane and insane could easily switch places if the insane were to become the majority. You would find yourself locked in a padded cell. No, and it wouldn't happen to me. So that's, that's the whole thing is he's yeah. completely skeptic the whole way through, which is great. Right up until almost the end of the movie, which yeah. is like, you, what if all these things you've seen, are you crazy? Well, well early on, it's he's treating the whole thing as a joke. He's yeah. so like, uh, he's great. I love Sam Neill. This might be my yeah, favorite he's sort role of, of Yeah, he's kind of awesome. He's he, kind of like a dick and sleazy. Yeah. And... <laughs> oh, gee, I'm sorry. You don't mind it? Well, his skepticism is, is, is he's almost like the, the John Carpenter surrogate. Yeah, he's for obviously sure. a very kind of cynical man. If that's what you saw, then it, I guess it would be a little unsettling. I'd be a little unnerved myself. But regardless, 
of what you saw, regardless of what you think, we are not living inside a Sutter Kane story. But yeah, so he's constantly like, this isn't real, this isn't real, this mm-hmm. is a publicity stunt, you guys are putting me up to it, but I'm getting paid, mm-hmm. so I'm going to go along with it. And then yeah, the more the, the kind of horrors start to creep in, there's a certain point, I think it's the scene where he goes to the bar and ends up talking to Vigo from Ghostbusters 2. Vigo the Carpathian. But where he's, he's almost saying, like, this isn't reality, but he's almost saying it at that point. He's still trying to be skeptical, but he's saying it to convince himself. Special effects. Hidden speakers, you people are professionals, I'll give you that. The thing I can't remember is what came first, us or the book. Vigo the Carpathian. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this guy for a second. <laughs> He's like, he was born to play Vigo the Carpathian. Exactly. That's... He sticks out in this movie. It's so <laughs> odd. It's like one of the, the townsfolk. Yeah. And uh, he just has this look about him that is, is otherworldly. He looks like an ancient being. He yeah. does. And uh, it's like, you know, they, they come upon this church in Hobbs End, uh, and this is the church where they believe a Sutter Kane sort of hold up and uh, <laughs> they pull up and Vigo the Carpathian. I want to say his name. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> his name is Vigo the Carpathian. <laughs> Johnny! Johnny boy! His son, Johnny boy. <laughs> Johnny boy! Johnny boy! <laughs> <laughs> Johnny boy! What is that accent? Where's that guy from? Oh, he's German. He's like from uh, Berlin or something. Okay. He's like, come on, Jenny. Johnny Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny. How did this guy end up in small town? I don't know. In small uh, town, like New, New England. England. Yeah. Johnny Boy. I'm from, I'm from New England. <laughs> <laughs> Is he wearing like overalls? He too? is. I feel like he it's looks like, like what yeah. is he? An old timey farmer or something? Yeah. I don't know. Building his log cabin. He's Vigo. Vigo, with his son Jenny Boy. <laughs> <laughs> something came leaking out. Took the little ones first and passed it on to us. Can I buy you a beer? Jenny, Jenny Boy. Earlier in the movie, so um, Sam Neill's not not convinced he's gonna actually take this job uh, first. He doesn't believe in it, and he's like, eh, whatever. So he kind of goes out with his buddy, I think the guy that you had mentioned earlier, to a diner, and uh, it's like a really great scene. So yes. it's like you know them in the foreground, kind of sitting at this booth, and it's by a window. And you just see this guy sort of come out in the background. All across the street, yeah. <laughs> But that scene is <laughs> executed, and that's when people talk about like later John Carpenter, and he yeah. kind of lost his mojo or whatever. Like mm. this movie and that scene in particular are like like as far as the way he kind of shoots and edits a scene. Yeah, uh, it's 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 up there with the best of his stuff. Yeah, it's really cool because it's yeah you see him slowly coming across his the way street, across the traffic, and, and then even when he smashes the window with his axe, we mm. get all these inserts of like coffee cups spilling to the ground. Yeah. All these the kind of minutia of what would happen in that scene that I think a lot of people would kind of then skip everyone's, over. Everyone's reaction, like, but, ah! yeah, but like the the pacing of it and the way it's edited and mm-hmm. yeah, those inserts. It's like this is classic John Carpenter stuff. Yeah, it's really good. Just seeing that guy kind of come across, you know, in like a kind of long shot in between the two of them is really really good. And you yeah. can hear the traffic and stuff like that. Do you read Sutter Kane? And that's, I think, even people that don't really care about this movie or remember it too well. That's, this is the part they remember is, do you read Sutter Kane? Yeah, do you read Sutter Kane? Yeah. And he's got, he's these, got like, the, these weird double irises. Yeah, these like amphibian eyes or something. Yeah, it's like the, the mummy, you know, the new mummy movie? Or like the eye split. New mummy movie? Yeah, the, the Tom Cruise. Did I see that? Is that real? What are you talking about? So this is a funny scene um, for me in particular, because when I first started out in VFX, I used to work around the corner from that restaurant. And we used to eat there all the time. Uh, It was like a Greek restaurant. And uh, years later, it turned into a video store. And that's the first video store where I actually rented in the mouth of madness. Not knowing, I'm assuming? Not knowing that at all. And then the, the clerk says, oh yeah, like watch out for the restaurant scene. Oh, that's funny. Kind of like, all right, whatever. And I kind of went home like, <laughs> oh my God. 
Well, that's interesting because the the uh, we find out later in the movie that yeah. this is uh, Sutter Kane's his agent, his agent yeah. that's gone crazy from reading his latest book his, right. that hasn't been published yet. In that scene, he comes out of a video store. So what is across the street is there the video, video store. There was a video 99 there used to be. And then the... the, the is that a chain place? It, is, it used to be a chain. And yeah. I, it, now since shut down, yeah. Video stores don't exist anymore. So. Uh, and then Roger's video moved into the the restaurant okay and now it turned into a bulk barn a what bulk barn what the fuck is a bulk barn <laughs> Do you have bulk barns here <laughs> this doesn't exist you're making these you know, words you buy, up. like bulk foods oh okay like a costco that's in the u.s yeah we but have it would like just be it's just kind of like club or it's like hey i want some corn nuts and then you go and there's a big bucket of corn nuts okay and you just scoop out into a plastic bag and they weigh it and blah 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 or i want some uh some cheese powder for like craft dinner macaroni and cheese <laughs> so you get a big scoop of it the bulk put... barn is where john carpenter goes to buy his cigarettes <laughs> give me your biggest bag of cigarettes <laughs> he's got a big <laughs> scoop <laughs> oh god my lungs he scoops, yeah, scoops them <laughs> in a giant bag like <laughs> candy <laughs> oh mr carpenter <laughs> it's good to see you again sir it's like the room you're my favorite customer <laughs> Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye. Oh, yeah. Okay. So then they begin the, the kind of journey. And this is like anything I remember from this movie is just like the repeated imagery and like yeah. these, things that really stuck with me over the years. The, the, the road trip to Hobbs End is the best part is pretty creepy. of the movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Still genuinely creepy. Because <laughs> it, it's really like if you've ever had to drive through the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. in the middle of night and it's just pure black and all you're seeing is the the lines in the road. It's like Lost Highway. Yeah, road yeah, it feels very uh, David Lynch, so he yeah. has repeated shots of, of roads going by. I mean, there's lots of creepy imagery in this scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has that kind of feeling of when you're driving late at night and you kind of get delirious or get tired. Right. This is one part, I think when she is driving mm -hmm. and she's seeing nothing, it's just pure blackness and just the lines in the road. And then at one point they just vanish and it's just pure blackness. That's awesome. That is the scariest fucking thing to I know, me. it's amazing. Yeah. But then like one of them as it uh, she looks over the side of the car. Uh, and then they kind of cross over into Hobbs End. But well, then, before that we got the bicycle man. Yeah, the bicycle man. Which that is bizarre and, and scary. And recurring. And and yeah, more of that kind of repetitive imagery. Oh, right. the first time it's just a kid on a bike. And that's a great shot too. When she looks into the mirror, it's he's just illuminated by the tail lights. Right. So he's pure red, and then it's again just nothing but darkness. Uh, but then later, yeah, he shows up, and it, not the best old age makeup, but it's so surreal that it works. It's pretty creepy, and he kind of goes by a, a, yeah, little, a little quick. In that context, it works. I can't get out. You won't let me out. It, that old man face, but with this child voice coming out of mm. it. It's so bizarre it's like, and unsettling, but just, I can't get out. I can't get out. He won't let me leave. He keeps repeating these things. Right. And it's almost like he's been in this loop, mm -hmm. like since he was a kid, just stuck trying to get yeah, out of this town. Yeah, that, that kind of, because that's a recurring thing too, is the- It kind of comes into play later The, the, in the passage movie. of time yeah. of, yeah, not realizing how much time has gone by. He's been just like stuck in this eternity, yeah. just like growing old, but he's still the, this kid. But like still this child he's old, voice. And it's just yeah. like, oh, it's creepy. I will say once they get to Hobbs End, that's when the movie kind of loses me for a little bit. Okay. Uh, as far as like the, the pacing goes. Right. Because up until this point, it, I, I think, it, I, like I said, the, the first half, I think, is just about perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they get there, you know, we have the Johnny boy, like the scene <laughs> in front of the church. Johnny boy! Yeah, and, and she, they go back to the, there's a lot of, like, they go back to the hotel they're staying at, then they go somewhere else, it's then they go back, back to the and hotel. Forth, yeah. And it doesn't feel like, we've talked about the repetition, it mm -hmm. doesn't feel like that's the case, it just feels like maybe sloppy writing or we just don't have um, anything for them to do and but there yeah but there's when they go back and she's like no you don't understand this was supposed to be a publicity stunt mm -hmm. but we weren't supposed to find anything this was a hoax we did send kane away on a publicity stunt only he never showed up harglow sent me with you to make it look good only we weren't supposed to find anything but we did and she's very concerned about all this but then after that scene she's basically out of the movie she goes to the church, yeah, she, she finds Sutter Kane, yeah. but she's, she's not, 
concerned or surprised, and I don't know if it's supposed to be like she's kind of under the spell of him. I think that was that was the thing. Cause it, like but Samuel, if that's the case, it's not really executed in a way where you get that because no. it just cuts from her being really concerned into the ho- in the hotel room mm-hmm. to then just she's just like a blank slate. Right. So it feels like it's missing something there with her character, some sort of connecting tissue or yeah. some scene that was like cut out or. Mm-hmm. But once he gets out of the town, that's where it kind of picks up again for me. Okay, there is that uh, like repetition where he's trying to get out, he's leaving, and then he kind of resets. Yeah, it, time like, keeps resetting itself. Well, so he keeps trying to change the narrative. It doesn't work. He ends up back at the church talking to the the writer of this whole story, Sutter Kane. Go now. I can't hold them back any longer. It's like a like a causality loop kind of thing where kinda, it's like he, he, the madness that's happening gets spread by him leaving the town and getting right. the manuscript out there. He gives him the manuscript. He's like, I've just finished it. I want you to take it out into the world. Yeah. Um, it's going to be like the biggest thing. It's actually called In the Mouth of Madness. Right. And it's this very, it's almost like sci-fi hallway. This yeah. This really long <laughs> hallway with these shafts of light coming in. So it's kind of cool because he kind of peels himself. Uh, Sutter and Kane just like rips himself open like a book. You get some very 90s digital effects. Yeah, done by ILM. Um, is that true? Yeah. That was ILM? That was ILM. I think it was just that one shot. As far as I know. They did that over a weekend. <laughs> they did that in their spare time. Well, they worked with uh, John Carpenter on Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Okay. I don't know. He but then we get some really cool practical effects. <laughs> I think Greg Nicotero? It's, it's can, what, Nicotero. Can be effects, which I don't know if they're technically still around anymore as yeah. can be. Yeah. But it was Greg Nicotero, Howard Berger, and Robert Kurtzman. Robert right. Kurtzman kind of left to do his own stuff, but um, those guys all kind of met working on like Evil Dead 2 oh, okay. uh, as individual effects artists, yeah. formed their own company. And then around the time this movie came out, the mid 90s, that was like the height of practical creature effects, the Fangoria stuff yeah. you read about in Fangoria magazine. These are really good, and I'm it's it's good that they're kind of used sparingly. Like they're kind of shown like well, it's like the here thing there again with the thing where exactly. the, you shoot it with just yeah, lots of shadows, lots of shafts of light. They're, they're out of focus in the background. The camera will be focused on Sam Neill. You just see him blurred out in the background. They're never like the kind of main focus of the of the shot because right. I, I feel like if you had held on, you know, some of them, I've kind of seen like shots from Fangoria and it's like all right cool but they're, they're not meant to be seen exactly. that way they're, they're just sort of meant to represent these like old ones that are that are coming through into our world and yeah. chasing him again again the the Lovecraft influence of this kind of unseen horror yeah exactly so. there's like little Lovecraft things here and there like they go to that hotel the Pikmin Hotel which is like named after a short story Pikmin's model mm. and uh, which is really creepy they have the the old lady oh the you mean the pretty young thing you came in here with? I don't know her at all. Oh yeah, we got to talk about her, yeah, Frances Bay. They're they're creepy enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. It, uh, talking about this kind of dipping into the surreal a little mm-hmm. bit. That's it, it borders on like we mentioned the 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 road, seeing the mm-hmm. road at night. It borders on some sort of Lynch, David Lynch influences. Yeah. And Frances Bay was in a lot of David Lynch's stuff. Oh, She's okay, on Twin okay. Peaks, and she was in Blue Velvet. I don't see how they could do that. I could never read a book. Most people know her as Happy Gilmore's grandma. <laughs> I think that's how everybody knows her. <laughs> and then later on, you just see her as this crazy monster thing, hacking up her husband with an again, again, with the creatures, though, where it's like mm-hmm. you see Sam Neill running to his car, and she's way in the distance. Right. We get a couple, like, quick shots of it and stuff, but it's still mostly yeah. in shadow and silhouette. And then he sort of ends up uh, back in our world. Hey, kid. And who shall ride up on, <laughs> on a bicycle? Have you been in an accident? Oh, why, it's Anakin Skywalker. It's Hayden Christensen. Hayden Christensen is a tiny boy. He's got to be like 12. He doesn't look anything like the kid from Phantom Menace. But th- this is the other section of the movie. Like I said, the, the, the second half of the Hobbs End stuff is where it feels unintentionally like repetitive you right. know not like it's supposed to be the time loop stuff but i'm just like yeah i could see okay that. they go to the hotel they go investigate they go back to the hotel mm-hmm. and there's not really much happening story-wise there's right. not a lot of progression 
Uh, but then his like desperate attempt to get back to the city uh, <laughs> leads to some great moments. Uh, On the bus, especially. The bus <laughs> is, is the best thing. Did I ever tell you my favorite color was blue? There's a lot of like kind of uh, dream within a dream. Like there's some like fake out wake ups. Yes. <laughs> that that shot it. of him screaming on the all blue bus. <laughs> what, one of my favorite images from any John yeah, Carpenter like, movie. Ah, he's got like a great scream. It's yeah. amazing. Um, and then he eventually makes it back to uh, to Charlton Heston. Well, this this is where I want to point out that this movie was written by head of New Line Cinema at the time, mm. Michael DeLuca, who only has, he has a couple story credits, he only has two screenwriting credits, which is this and Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Oh, no. uh, not only the worst Nightmare on Elm Street movie, but one of the worst horror sequels of all time. I guess when you um, own the studio, though, and you write these movies, yeah, much he, like... he, wasn't, he didn't own it. Bob Shea owned New Line Cinema. Okay, he was like so the he was head like the executive president or, or something. Right. I don't know his exact title. It's like, I wrote but... this terrible movie. You gotta direct it. Yeah, it's I don't like, know why no. he wrote these two movies, but Sam Neill's like, yeah, you know, you sent me with Styles to go investigate this whole Hobbs End and Sutter Kane thing. Style. Oh, that's the girl you say I sent with you, did it? But I know I sent you off alone. The exact same scene is in Freddy's Dead. Really? <laughs> with, yeah, the main uh, character of that movie who turns out, spoilers, to be Freddy's daughter. She works at, like, this uh, home for troubled youth. Mm -hmm takes a group of the troubled youth to Springwood, Ohio, where Freddy's from, and they all get killed off, and then she goes back to the group home and says to her boss, like, I, all the kids, you know, they vanished in Elm Street. I don't know what happened to them. Been handling too many cases, Maggie. Those kids were never here. Why wouldn't I remember her? I would remember getting new arrival. So the exact same scene. The running gag that he had between <laughs> movies. That or he's just horribly uncreative. <laughs> yeah, he's... Which straight. is why he only wrote two scripts, and one of them is Freddy's dead. <laughs> We kind of like end the movie where it sort of like finishes up where we started off. So something's sort of happening outside. You don't really know. Well, that's, yeah, they, they, they establish that early in the movie and then it comes back to it. And it's mm -hmm. good to point out it's like really great atmospheric stuff where you just, it's just all like you're with him in the, uh, in his room, in his padded room. Yeah. Which he's drawn with a crayon, cross, like, crosses everywhere. And on his face with a crayon. Yeah, I think all that's over. Possible. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> It's a great image visually, yeah, but, uh, for sure. but yeah, so much of that where you're just like, <laughs> he, you know, it, there's a storm going on, mm -hmm. so there's like thunder and lightning everywhere, but just, yeah, you, you, you get the sense that the world is falling apart without us actually seeing any of it. And even when he's being brought in at the beginning, there's kind of just hints of like dialogue. Things must be getting pretty bad out there to bring you fellas in. One of the, the creepiest shots in the movie, this is from the early part, is when he's in his cell and you just see that hand with just, it looks like a normal hand, just like slightly longer fingernails. Mm -hmm. Like something feels just slightly off about it. It's really creepy. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in this movie. Like yeah. from a visual standpoint that I uh, really remember and like really sticks with me after all yeah. these years. Um, Would you say it sticks with you as much as like uh, a lot of the, the creative imagery in like uh, John Carpenter's Vampires? <laughs> vampires. The, the, all the, the creepy close-ups of James Woods' face. James Woods, where he's walking away, he's wearing these, like, uh, the old people pants. He's got... Pull no, he's cool in that movie. <laughs> yeah, he's trying to be cool in that movie. He's like, yeah, I'm a tough guy. And he's like, I don't know, 70 years old. He's got, his, <laughs> he's got tight jeans pulled up to his chest. Man. I know this book will drive people crazy. I hope so. The movie comes out next month. And this is the third part of, it's not even really a trilogy, but people call it like the, the apocalypse trilogy because right. they're all sort of movies that are like right on the brink of the world falling apart. Right. Um, some of the stuff earlier, like when he sees the cop in the alley, later when, he, when the repetition of it where all the homeless people are behind him and right. they start taking an ax to him, that looks really similar visually to some of the stuff in Prince of Darkness with oh, like okay. uh, Alice Cooper, Alice Cooper and, that's right. yeah, all the other homeless people. But this is the first time we've seen the world has fallen apart. Yeah, for you sure. See so we see him leaving the, after, the yeah. asylum. And it's, it's great too, because it's very economical. It's not, we're not seeing like, you know, cities on fire. It's just 
uh, like a turned over van and a bunch of paper it's laid pretty in the low yard. Budget. It's it's effective. It's but effective. It's, yeah. yeah. It's I mean, cost, it's like like Escape from New York stuff. Where yeah, it's like, for sure. We don't need to see too much of it. Uh, oh, and that's then. Then the movie ends with the same music it opens with. Mm. We didn't talk about that. We John Carpenter the did music. the score. Uh, one of his least memorable scores, for the most part. I thought so. It's all very, you know, just kind of atmospheric tones and yeah. that kind of stuff. The opening credit music, he wanted to get Metallica. Oh. He wanted, I think, Enter Sandman? That makes sense. He couldn't get it, so then he just made his corny generic version his of a Metallica song. Of spooky metal. <laughs> I never thought much of it. I didn't remember it really. It sticks then, out like a sore thumb from the rest of the music in the movie. For sure. But uh, <laughs> it's like when I went to see him play, and I, you saw him uh, twice, right? No, just once. Oh, just the one time. Yeah. Okay. Well, he played in uh, uh, Toronto, and we went to see him, and this is the soundtrack that I thought the least of. I'm like, oh, there's the Halloween one, there's, you know, uh, Escape from New York. And when this played, this like blew the roof off the place. It was it's, insane. That's because it's, it's John Carpenter trying to be Metallica. Yeah, he's just, <laughs> well, he's just sort of on a keyboard kind of going. Bah, 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 yeah, it's the rest of the band. And it's just the guitars because it's just all guitar riffs and amazing like spooky rock. Yeah. Horror rock. And so it opens the movie, it ends the movie. Yeah, the whole audience just lost their shit. And I was like, <laughs> what the fuck is this? It was amazing. <laughs> but that's, it's worth pointing out that yeah, those opening credits are kind of great too, because the whole movie is about, you know, Sutter Kane is sort of creating this world and we're seeing the creation of the book. It's the, like the printing book, press. Yeah, the printing press. and. Uh, it, I'm a sucker for stuff like that, like yeah. any kind of movie that opens up with like a printing press and showing like things being made. And, yeah, well it's similar to the opening of uh, Christine too, which shows the creation of the car. Oh, okay. Relax, buddy. You're awake now. <laughs> but yeah, if you wrote John Carpenter off, uh, because you saw Escape from L.A. on cable once and said, I'm never watching anything this man ever makes again. I saw that twice in the theater. Oh, my God. I twice. I went once, and then I took my Did you friends. see it again? Maybe it gets better on second viewing. No, I, I can't. <laughs> I've got a complicated relationship with that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt Russell's great in it. He's great, yeah. It's pretty much the same movie, but just shittier. But terrible. <laughs> but terrible. Yeah. That it's really surfing bad. scene. Oh my god. We'll make this a mini review of Escape from LA because yeah. we'll never do it, but the effects are awful, Everything, even for the time. Even for the time, they were really, really bad. Yeah. It's like, what kind of budget did this movie have? It was so awful. The one scene I like is the Bangkok rules scene. Nobody draws until this hits the ground. Uh, they showed it in the trailer. That's true. They ruined it. They spoiled it. That's because they're like, this is all we got. It's the one good scene. I like how you go into the theater. It's like, wow, like Snake Plissken's back. And then it's like him playing basketball for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Shooting hoops. <laughs> like, and surfing uh, in front of a green screen. This is, this it is, looks like a, like a sitcom. Like, whoa. It's like something they'd have in those old like 50s it's movies. Like, like, a, like Hang a, 10. Yeah, like a beach blanket bingo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the Mouth of Madness, check it out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 